So, hi, Matthew. How are you? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. I invite you to share your screen, finding the unfindable button of sharing screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... Uh... It's a design something when uh, the primary activity is the most elusive. All right, that turns off my screen. Let's try this one. What do we do with this one? Ah, yeah, we can see All it. All right, excellent. We, we can see it, and we're really glad to have you. Uh, just remind to everybody that you have a, a great newsletter uh, that RESTful notes that. Uh, uh, yeah, people can subscribe to. Uh, I will share the link in the chat uh, during uh, your talk for people to be able to to know more about what you say. You've been following this space for a long time, especially about governance and other topics. We're really glad to have you. The stage is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you very much, Matthew. Great. Thank you so much. First and foremost, for everybody out there, I hope you and yours are healthy and safe at this time. I think one of the silver linings of this type of opportunity is that you get a window into the people that you might otherwise only know from conferences or online. This is my workshop. This is my shop apron. And as was mentioned, my name is Matthew Reinbold. I'm the director for the Capital One uh, Platform Services Center of Excellence, which is a whole bunch of words, which means that my team and I are responsible for the health of our API ecosystem. At Capital One, we have approximately 9,000, 10,000 developers. They've produced thousands of APIs by this point. And we look at approximately 3.5 billion requests and response every single day. It's a very large, mature ecosystem that powers our business and experiences. Um, most places, what my team and I do would be called API governance. And we've shied away from that and we've gone down to the platform level simply because because of our initial success we've started expanding into other areas of things around data transformation event streaming and that kind of thing and as Mehdi mentioned i also write a, a regular newsletter called net api notes it's a weekly newsletter that just celebrated its fifth anniversary so that is an ongoing process of me going out looking at the industry capturing highlights and insights and then subsequently bringing them back and trying to share what I'm learning with the rest of the community. Um, and so between my day job and the newsletter, I've seen a few things. I've seen what it takes to be successful in the space. I've also seen people that aren't so successful. And so hopefully I'm, I'm going to share some of those insights around what makes an architecture successful, how to roll it out, and maybe even redefine your concept of API governance in the process. There's plenty of blog posts and presentations that go very deep into the technical and tactical side. Some of those are even at the conference. I think right now I happen to be up against the API handyman with a very tactical type of presentation. Um, but if you only focus on the tactics, you can get in trouble. Uh, we probably are all familiar with stories about cargo culting and the the horrors that subsequently happen when companies take that on. It's, it's situations where a tech team implements every single element in some other company's tech stack. They read a Netflix blog or, or see a new open source project from Facebook and they adopt it wholeheartedly expecting to achieve the same results. But if the technology is right, then why don't we see these results propagating everywhere? Well, it's because they didn't have the right strategy. They didn't have the right communication that to underpin and support that technology. Uh, this talk is for anyone who wants to create better, more well-designed software, not just APIs. But in order to do that, we're going to have to architect our people, not just the machines. Uh, in the process, we're going to talk about a few things, but again, so much of this is contextual, and I've included a footer down at the bottom. If we want to go deep into this, if we want to expand the conversation beyond our initial 25 minutes here, please use one of the links below in the in the footer, and let's keep this going. Because I don't think any one person has completely cracked this, and it's only by sharing information and, and talking through some of our own individual situations that we're going to elevate the entire discourse. First part, let's talk about the power of organizations on an architecture. 
1968, Melvin Conway published a paper entitled How Do Committees Invent? In it, he proposed that the way an organization was arranged directly and dramatically affects the way software is made. The early anecdotal observation that he made was later supported by quantitative research. That research essentially says that organizational distribution and product modularity are correlated and that products really do end up looking like the teams that create them. Uh, to illustrate this with a quick example, suppose a company has two development teams, one supporting the warehouse and another one supporting the back office. What Conway's law essentially says is that if we decide we're going to be producing APIs, our first pass at our API ecosystem is going to produce two different APIs. The warehouse team is going to produce an API and the back office team is going to be produce an API, which is unfortunate if the reason we're producing APIs is to support third parties who really don't care how the organization is structured. They just want to achieve certain tasks. Organizational arrangement doesn't just affect the modularity, however. It turns out that organizational complexity is also the greatest determining factor in how buggy a piece of code is. The more complex the organizational communication is, the worse the code is. This is due in part to how removed decision makers are from the implementers. That's not all. In 2018, there was a book published called Accelerate. It was all about how to build and scale high-performing technology organizations. One of the key quotes, the key insights that they had from that book was that if we achieve a loosely coupled, well-encapsulated architecture with an organiz organizational structure to match, we can achieve better delivery results. Again, it's not just the architecture, but the architecture supported by the organizational structure. And that's absolutely necessary in order to grow the size of the engineering organization and increase the product linearity. This is perhaps one of my most favorite API books of this past year, and it doesn't market itself as an API book. Team Topologies is an entire book dedicated to nothing but organizational arrangements. The authors agree it isn't just getting the technology right, it's designing the organization that utilizes the technology. And they say, quote, never before has explicit socio-technical design been so important. We'll talk more about that $5 word, socio-technical, in a few minutes. W. Edwards Deming was an American engineer and a management consultant, often credited as one of the inspirations for the Japanese post-war economic miracle of the 1960s. When it came to organizational arrangements, Deming said, the fact is, the system that people work in and the interactions with people may account for 90 or 95% of performance. We can debate monoliths versus microservices, which service mesh to implement and which linking strategy might be our favorite. Those are religious turf wars we're probably all familiar with. However, what Deming is saying here is that those optimizations to the technology are micro when compared to the organizational influence over that architecture. Designing better APIs means first recognizing and then addressing Conway's law. At the 2016 API Strat conference, I presented three ways Conway's law affects API governance. I want this presentation that I'm doing now to be additive. I want it to build on that previous work. If you're at all interested in detailed breakdowns of how things like hierarchy, geographical organization, and third-party lines of communication can pull and nudge the API design in particular ways, I encourage you to check out that presentation. But I do want to at least present one new example to help further illustrate these type of concerns. That comes from a company called Buffer. Buffer is a social network management platform. And in 2015, Buffer acquired another company called Respondly. Respondly was something that enabled social media teams to respond to customers. It was a great match. The technical leadership there, however, now found themselves managing two different monolithic architectures. These two products, Buffer and Respondly, were not connected in any way because they were previously two different companies. Despite offering complementary products, the arrangement of their organizations after purchase meant there were significant problems in delivering business value, something as simple as single sign-on. 
was really hard to do. In March 2017, realizing this, Buffer reimagined itself as a platform that would support multiple complementary products. The technical team realigned themselves into a series of teams responsible for core functionalities. These are things like billing and sessions and centralized storage of a user's social media account connections. On top of this, they reorganized both their architecture and their teams around the jobs that their customers needed to get done. Things like publish and reply and analyze. It was no longer two separate monolithic stacks. It, they reorganized the team in order to support a more customer-centric delivery of services. Buffer needed to change its architecture, which necessitated a change to its organization. But does this go both ways? Are we only uh, at the will of the organizational structure for the kinds of things that we produce? Or could the architecture influence the organization? There's a very uh, eloquent and lovely speaker named Vicki Boykis. She is a data scientist and also a tech essayist. And in her June 6 newsletter, she wrote that something happened in the last 30 years where developers transformed from some nerds sitting in a company's basement to the driving force of the company itself. Developers now have a lot of power and consequently are doing as just, just as much work building companies as in building the code. To think about it another way. Feng Shui is a design, design practice that attempts to use the arrangement of objects to harmonize people in their surroundings. Likewise, APIs are arrangements of power. Designed with purpose, the arrangements have the power to reshape organizations. The relationship between people and systems has been studied for some time. The field of socio-technical systems engineering dates back to World War II. The word socio-technical, which I mentioned earlier, refers to the interrelatedness of the social and technical aspects of the organization. It seeks to optimize both the people and the machine in order to improve performance and work-life quality. Taking a socio-technical systems approach, an API practice attempts to identify the systematic power arrangements that exist within an organization and optimize them. As explained earlier, these factors have an enormous impact on the type of software produced, and yet we rarely see this kind of analysis. Why is that? Well, let's speculate, because that's what these kind of events are for. I would guess, just a guess, that the messy, complicated work with people is something outside of most engineers' training. It's something that we usually derisively re regulate to the humanities. Or perhaps that it's just we as people, especially here in the U.S., are just, uh, you know, trained to think about the individual pieces instead of the system as a whole. Whatever the reason, given the power that the organizational arrangements have on the ability to deliver quality code, that's a shame. Danella Meadows, who you see here, was one of the foremost system thinkers. In her book, Thinking in Systems, she said, the scarcest resource is not oil or metal or clean air, capital, labor, or technology. It's our willingness to listen to each other and learn from each other and seek the truth rather than seek to be right. And ultimately, this is why that cargo culting fails. All the importing of another company's open source toolkits, their development playbooks, and their social media outreach does nothing to address the organizational communication that they're arriving in. So using architecture as a beachhead for changing an organization has a name. That's the inverse Conway maneuver. And that's where the architectural needs required for consistent cohesive design and fast flow are considered first and then subsequently the organization is designed around it. That may sound crazy. It may sound audacious, but change happens all the time, even to organizational arrangements. Sometimes it's not the way we want it to and something. sometimes it's not according to our preferred timeline, but it does in ways both tiny and epic. Probably the most notable from the API space is the Bezos memo, 
As the story goes, one day in 2003, Jeff Bezos required that everyone create an API interface for their services. Anyone that didn't do so would be fired. That sounds harsh. It's okay. The email ended with Bezos wishing the recipient a lovely day. A bit passive aggressive, but that's how they do things. The change in how the organization communicated among itself set the stage for AWS. That's now a, a business line that makes tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars for them. It's profound. Now, you may not be Jeff Bezos. You may not have the hierarchical power to declare that kind of change at that kind of level. Where do you begin if you're somewhere other than the top of the org? That's a very big topic. There's only so much I can cover, but I want to at least highlight two different approaches that should at least be in every socio-technical entrepreneur's toolbox. And they are one, shrink the change, and two, scripting the critical moves. They both come from this book I have on the screen here called Switch. There's a number of other books that I'll highlight at the end, but while many of these change and habit forming books focus on the individual, I found this one very apt for thinking about change in organizations. So the first technique that I talked about that I suggested is shrinking the change. Up or upending your entire organization might feel necessary, but starting with an intent that large will probably be met with the same proportional resistance. It shrink the change that you're trying to attempt. And in the process, you'll shrink the likelihood that people will say no. If you can't change your organization from the get-go, start with your line of business. If you can't change your line of business, start with your program. If you can't change your program, start with your team. And if you can't change how your team communicates, start with how you communicate and with whom. That's very important. The first step is usually looking at who you are reaching out to, who your team is reaching out to, who your program is reaching out to, how you partner, how you align yourself, and how you subsequently create those accesses to information. Access to information is the first step before you begin to codify and start creating those API designs. So the next thing that I wanna briefly cover is about scripting the critical moves. So we are currently in this time period where there's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, not all of it immediately burning at the forefront of our heads, but it's eating away at our energy and our reserves in the back of our heads. We're ending our days exhausted and not necessarily understanding why. In that kind of environment, launching into brand new initiatives, launching into ambiguous surveys of a landscape aren't necessarily the things that will be well received by a population that feels as though it's under constant attack every time they open up their Twitter feed. So in that kind of environment, it becomes very important to script the critical moves, remove the decision making, remove the ambiguity, and provide a very simple, straightforward plan by which people can achieve the kind of success that you're looking for. This is something that I'm working with James Higginbotham, who also goes by the name Launch Any on many social media channels. We're currently looking at how do you create a program for finding domain context? How do you create a streamlined path out of the wealth of tools and techniques that are, exist in the world right now? How do you boil that down and provide a simple, straightforward path? Yes, maybe in certain contexts, there may be things that are better optimized. Maybe there are things that might appeal to somebody else. But right now, it's about scripting the critical moves and providing people a roadmap so that they can begin their journey. And it's incredibly important for us in these larger change initiatives. Those were two techniques, but I want to make sure that we set a baseline, that we understand the, the, the message that I'm trying to convey here. I know that changing your organizations may not have been what you signed up for when you assumed responsibility for your APIs. I know that the reason that you chose software and architecture was probably the hard certainty of ones and zeros rather than the squishy, unpredictable nature of the people around you. 
But honestly, why is it that we'd spend thousands of dollars on ongoing training and hours and hours of precious time getting certified and even traveling across continents to learn from people in person back when we used to do that? Why do we do that? But yet doing Google searches to get better and more efficient at communication is somehow beyond us. That thing that we do every single day, running effective meetings, reaching out, creating relationships, that's somehow too much, even though that's the building block by which all of this other stuff happens. Working with people to build better organizational structures is like any other, it's a skill, it can be learned but only when us as API designers and architects stop thinking that our responsibilities end at the interface and start thinking of ourselves as socio-technical entrepreneurs. The ability of your organizations to deliver business value reliably, scale, scalably, and in the face of accelerating change is absolutely dependent on it. You should be a designer, not just of APIs, but a designer of organizational structure. It's time to get good on the people. Let's bring it home. When it comes to software systems, many conclude that API governance is some kind of checklist. There are some rules and we're gonna make everybody adhere to the rules. While the enforcement of common practice on something like an open API description might be a tactic, it's not a strategy for creating a better organization. Governance broadly refers to who decides what's in a platform's ecosystem. A governance is a framework for how we choose to coexist, how we get along, how we work together. Checking for naming inconsistencies and implementation detail leakage is one thing. Being a conscientious creator of organizational arrangements is another. The invitation to co-create these arrangements changes the way information flows within a company. Changing the way communication flows is a precursor for changing behavior and changing behavior is a precursor for changing the organization itself. That is the true power of API governance. That's what your centers of excellence or centers of enablement should be aspiring to in order to deliver long-term business value. I have some books here. They are equally applicable to organizational design as they are for personal design. There's Accelerate and Team Topologies, Thinking and Systems, Platform Ecosystems, all wonderful books that I tore through very quickly, but they do require a different lens. You are not going to find the secrets to service mesh in these particular books. There's also a fair amount of literature out there, especially a lot of good resources in the agile space on how to nudge the organization toward a more healthier, uh, more viable communication. So um, we have these number of books. The last one, this Blue Ocean Strategy, I will say, that it does go off into some different areas, but if you focus on the last third, there is some absolute gold in that particular book. Again, I wish you health, I wish you safety, and I wish that we will continue this conversation. You can find me at these places below. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, if you have time for uh, some questions. Uh, sure. Yeah, um, so it seems that in many organizations, there are, in big organizations, some teams are already starting starting their API programs at different levels. Some do for, let's say, technical reasons, some do for digital transformation reasons, some do for business, to drive the business differently reasons, like API as a product, for example. And at some point, when these API practice will grow, they will they will, they will be in contact with each other. At some point, there will be a decision, an arrangement of power. How do you see the, this happening? Is it a merge? Is it try, do you try to find a common denominator? Or is it either a bigger mandate that will decide about which one will you, we will use? Because these teams sometimes have started two or three years ago. And at some point, one will have to surrender compared to another. How do you, how do you manage that? Right. Um, so I'll give the stock architect answer of it depends. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, whether or not you have a platform services group, whether or not you have a center of excellence, you have teams that are self-organizing, whether or not they recognize it themselves. They are trying to get work done and it, through the process, they are creating norms, they're creating behaviors, they're creating approaches to the work that 
happen whether or not the leadership is aware of it. The important thing that can happen is recognizing those that are willing to carry the water from those individual groups and identify the good ideas and start articulating that as not best practice necessarily, but common practice within the org. So whether that's a formalized position that's recognized by executive leadership or whether that is an informal community of practice, I've seen both of those approaches work. It's just you do need a recognition that it's already happening. Your people are bright people and that you honor their work and not try and clobber it with the kind of ivory tower enterprise architecture where you anoint a few blessed few to go off and, and figure it out and then come back and tell everybody what what they might have already been doing for the past two or three years. Yeah, uh, for, for the rest of the question, can you just remove your screen so we can see you better? Uh, if that's okay. Um, uh, one question about the Conway's law uh, is that uh, if the if companies are condemned to reproduce their org, org structure into their communication systems, can you use communication systems to change the org structure? So can you use it in the other way to start the change? Yes, absolutely. And that's what I was referring to as the inverse Conway's maneuver. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back to the Bezos memo. Jeff Bezos and his leadership team recognized that they were here and they needed to be over here in order that if they had these scaling issues and they needed uh, an architectural interface, then a lot of other people would be too. And so therefore, okay, we are going to change our architectural approach to actually drive our business to a different spot. So that change in the, the architecture led to a completely different organization than if, for example, in 2020, Amazon still sold books. Yeah, that, that makes that makes sense. Also, there is about these this Conway's law. There is a, a sometimes people call it the corollary. It means that you know uh, every team should be able to open its software via an API to other part of the organization or or, or, or partners, right? Uh, but it seems that on the contrary, some people claim that if you can't divide your software into two different APIs, right, or your teams behind two different API-led teams. It means you're to couple that you should not, you should not go to the gran more granular level. You are the right level directly, right? And so that's a way to define the right scope, business scope of the API you're you're building. Over granularization of a design architecture is certainly an issue. One of the best and most profound pithy statements that I ever heard regarding those boundaries was your bounded context that you encapsulate in an interface really should be a bet on the things that change together. And I, I adore that definition because one, by saying it's a bet, it acknowledges that this will change and this is our best guess at this time. And the second aspect of that, the things that change together. It's an acknowledgement. It doesn't completely solve the problem. It doesn't get into the weeds of exactly what needs to be in that. But it's it's a recognition that change is your chief driver. And the things that you um, forecast as changing together ought to be together. Using that definition, using that architectural rule of thumb, then you can start thinking about the teams that need to support that. Okay, this aspect of our business happens to be rather large and it's it's very nebulous and we're still figuring it out and we need approximately two to three teams to support that particular API and interface versus, hey, here's this thing that's really well understood and stable and we know we'll need exactly one team to maintain that and grow it and scale it. Okay, that's how ultimately I think we can use the kind of bounded context and domain thinking to then subsequently back into staffing and management. Uh, maybe last question here. A uh, lot of people, when they think about their API program, they think in terms of a budget for the technical solution, you know, API management, API monitoring, API lifecycle. Uh, to your experience, how much in terms of a percentage or arbitrary value, right, you decide, needs to be invested into the people aspect? So if you invest one in the technology, how much, again, it depends, right? But how much yeah. do you scale? 
how much you should invest into your right. people evangelization practice. Right. Uh, obviously, that's going to depend a lot on the the type of organization that you're in. If you have a healthy culture that is able to have virtuous feedback loops, that's able to raise issues and quickly scramble and and mobilize people, it's going to be a very different type of monetary budget type of situation than when you are hyper focused on getting everybody the latest service mesh certified and yet you can't run an effective meeting. Like it's going to depend a lot on your particular context. And I don't have a, a golden ratio for number of dollars for tech training versus number of dollars for, for um, your, your human training. The fact that I even refer to it as human training means we probably have some maturity as an industry in how we think about these things, even throwing out concepts like socio-technical, despite the fact it's been around since World War II, I can't just put my finger on a workshop that is exactly what everybody should be doing. Bottom line, we need to, as we are maturing, we're now in the new phase of API adoption where we know the technology, we have push button solutions for this type of stuff. Now let's focus on the human element, the human side of this and drive that. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, yeah, it was great uh, explanation about the the large the large context about yeah how change is being driven by APIs and the people and process and technology and how to make the right balance between all of these. Thank you. Have a nice day <laughs> at Capital One, and uh, see you at next uh, API events probably. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. So for uh, for the next talk, so we were waiting for uh, some news from Mario Flores, 